Hey, Vice community, welcome to Online Chapel. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Um, man, I sure do miss every single one of you and miss our times together, but I'm glad that we have this opportunity uh, just to share in God's goodness with one another. Uh, today is a very, very special chapel when we will get to hear from some of the people who have invested in your life over this last season of time here at Bice and are now transitioning onto something that is next. And so I can't wait for us to hear from them. But before we do, let's worship together. I love you, Lord. Though your mercy never fails me, though my days I've been held in your hands, the moment that I wake up, I I lay my head, and I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been
is a grace with the heart of sun that fire. Not a wave when the holds are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be another in the fire standing next to me there's another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free there's a cross that bears the burden there another another in the fire another in the fire all oh, my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave sin anymore Should I fall in this place between what remains of me and this reckoning Laid away I won't bow to the things of this world And I know I will never be alone It's another There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never.
I hope you know that um, even when you are experiencing times of, of loneliness or when you feel like that you are all alone, that you're reminded by words from this song that there is always a fourth person in that fire or there is always somebody that is there with you. In fact, we could say that because of Christ and because of the work of His Holy Spirit in us, we are never alone. We are never forsaken. Uh, so in these times of solitude, in these times of having to uh, stay inside and isolate from others, don't forget that Christ is there with you. Now in Ecclesiastes 3, uh, King Solomon reminds us that there is a time and a season for every activity under the sun. Um, and he doesn't quite say it like this, but in essence, uh, one thing that he is telling us is that there's a time that we say hello, and there is a time that we say uh, goodbye. It's not always easy, um, but they are different seasons in our, in our lives, and they're both very important. And it's important that we always say goodbye properly. In fact, a few years ago when I was in Ecuador uh, and I said goodbye to some friends that I had met while, while I was there, they came running up to me after I said goodbye and they said, no, no, please don't say goodbye. Uh, we don't say adios, we say hasta luego. Or we say see you later, not goodbye. Um, and, and I think that's what you're hearing from, from these teachers today that have just poured into your life or that are going to be pouring into your life, uh, it's a see you later and it's them expressing their gratitude for the time that they have had with you. So let's watch this together and uh, I pray that you'll be inspired by these words from our teachers today. Hi, secondary teachers and students. I am sad that my three years at Baez has um, come to a close, and I am just so thankful to have been part of this community. Um, I think there's something so special about the Baez community. I've loved working with um, the awesome teachers you guys have here, administrators, and especially you guys, the students. Um, you all who have been able to get to know um, more personally, that's just been my highlight of my time here. And just being a part of the whole community has been awesome. I will still be part, I will still be in Cotabaro, so hopefully I'll see you guys around next year too. Um, so Mr. Whitehurst asked me to share about something that I've learned um, in my time here at Baez. And so I was thinking about that and uh, decided on something that God taught me my first year that I think is really, um, relevant now. So when I was teaching sixth grade Bible, eighth graders, if you remember, we talked about uh, faith and how that's the opposite of complaining. Uh, we talked about how the Israelites, would they complained about everything, right? Uh, and we said, why were they complaining? It's because they were saying, I can't be happy unless I have this thing. I can't be joyful and let, I can't have like security. My identity is in this thing, whatever that was. For them, mostly I remember food. They, they, they were complaining a lot about manna, not liking manna, etc. Uh, and so we talked about how, what do we put our, what is that thing that we put our happiness in, our hope in that we say, I can't be happy unless I have this thing. And that is an idol. And that's the opposite of faith. Um, and so that really um, struck me because uh, growing up, I used to have this kind of false idea about faith. I used to think faith was just having the certainty that God was going to do a miracle, like something, you know, um, and God definitely does do miracles. But I thought it was like, okay, I have faith that God will heal this person or God will bring a revival. And, um, but actually, that's not uh, really what faith is about. Um, we see uh, in the Bible, um, you know, so many times followers of Christ are going through 
go through terrible suffering and uh, persecution and torture and beheadings and stuff like that. But how were they able to um, be joyful in the midst of that is because their hope, their joy was not in their life in, in in the comforts of this world, but in Christ, you know, like Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Um, and so anyway, that's just been challenging me this last quarter. I'm sad that I cannot be on campus this last year. I I told my ninth grade um, Bible study girls, uh, me and Miss Harsona uh, had them for our small group. And we talked about our like goals for this year. And I didn't know I would be leading bias at the time. But one thing I said was I really want to just, you know, enjoy every moment of the school year and really savor it. And um, and then this is sad because I'm not having this last quarter on campus. Uh, but, you know, I'm just trusting the Lord and I keep praying, you know, that God's going to use this, all these terrible, this terrible uh, world event for somehow for his kingdom. Um, and so anyway, I'm sure a lot of you guys probably are feeling the same way and just sad that you know, you can't be on campus with your friends, maybe uncertainty about world events. And um, so I just want to uh, encourage all of us, myself included, just to, to have that kind of faith in God that no matter what happens, we still have the most important thing. We have Christ. And I want to close with one verse that I've been thinking about during this time, Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18. And it says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And so I love that. You know, he's talking about even if he has no food and we all have food, thank goodness. But, um, but he's saying no matter what happens, you know, my joy is in God. All right. So. Thank you, Bias Community, for an awesome three years. Goodbye. Good morning, Bias. Happy Thursday. Happy Chapel Day. Happy quarantine. I don't know what number day we are on of that, but happy day. Um, I'm here this morning, and I'm honored and privileged to have the opportunity to talk to you um, about what's next for the Nielsens. Mr. Nielsen is going to also get to do that a little bit later this morning. Um, so you get my perspective first. So what's next for the Nielsens? Uh, we are going to be moving on to um, a sister school of Bice in Ankara, Turkey. Ankara is the capital of Turkey. And the school is called Oasis International School or OIS for short. Uh, and we hope to be there in time for the start of the 2020-2021 school year. It's stating the obvious at this point to say uh, we're not certain of exactly when we're leaving or exactly when we will arrive there. But that is the plan thus far. Uh, what I really want to spend some time talking to you about this morning is just a little bit about our journey of how we came to this decision and the why, um, mostly related to me. I'm not gonna speak too much for Mr. Nielsen, our, our girls, um, but just a little bit about um, what God's been teaching me uh, through this journey and this decision. Um, and quite honestly, you guys have, many of you guys have asked me um, since we made the announcement in January, um, lots of questions about why we're going. And um, this has basically been the theme of them or some of them. Um, so you guys have worked at BICE for a long time. Are you just needing a change? Feeling like it's time for you to go? Um, Ms. Nielsen, is that school a better school than BICE? Is that why you're going? Um, Ms. Nielsen, is Nick's making you go um, to this new place? Um, and I just want to start out by answering those questions with no, no, and no. Um, we began this year with absolutely no idea or thought or plan of making any kind of change um, from leaving BICE. We love BICE. Um, I'm certain it will be a wonderful place that we're moving to um, with new people and a new community, um, but it'll just be a different place. It won't be a better place than BICE. Um, and Nix is not making us go. Um, this decision has been come to you through discussion um, and prayer, although it did happen rather quickly in the end. Um, 
you know, a lot has gone uh, into it for us. And so um, it just became clear um, at the beginning of January that this is the place that God was moving us onto. Um, I've also heard some things like this, um, but Emily's graduating and she won't get back to see people. She's going to have to go to Turkey to visit and she won't know people there. And Rachel's going into 11th grade and it's her last two years of high school and wouldn't it be better for her to finish and here instead of there? And um, to those things, I would say yes and yes. Those have been um, very difficult parts of all of this um, and definitely things that we considered as we prayerfully made this decision. Um, but we are going. Um, and I just want to move into you talking about what God's been teaching me through this. Um, I'm going to start with a quote by one of my favorite theologians, John Piper, um, who has said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of about three of them. Um, I don't know if I'm aware of even three um, in this particular situation, and I'm only going to talk about one. Um, and so for me, and I'm, I'm certain um, God has many things that he wants us to do in this next place as he's had us in this place for a time. Um, his purposes and plans are not for me to fully understand. Um, but one thing that he has been doing um, is showing me again in, in this season and reminding me that I tend to make my plans my idol, and he's breaking me out of the sin of pride. He's been doing that for my whole life. He's just doing it a different way this season. Um, Proverbs 69 says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. If you know me at all, you know that I like routine, I like common sense, I love tradition, and I love to be settled. I do not like spontaneity. I do not like disorganized, chaotic things or situations. And I really don't like change at all. Uh, and to some extent, those things are OK. Those attitudes are OK. Um, the fact that I like to plan works well for my job, generally. Um, but it's very easy for me to make my plans my idol. Um, and if you're a believer, um, you know um, that it's God's plan for us to glorify him and honor him with our lives. Um, and there's a fancy Christian word for that called sanctification, if you're a believer, the process of becoming more conformed to his image and thinking like him and feeling the things he does and um, knowing him more so that we can honor him. And he does that by his word, by his Holy Spirit working in us. Um, and one of the circumstantial ways that he has done that throughout my adult life is taking my plans and establishing my steps in different physical places. Um, most of you know that we've lived in Papua New Guinea for a time, we live in Korea for a time, America, um, and we've been in Indonesia for the past six years. Um, and every one of those moves, I mean, I wish I could say, like every time I'm like, yes, change, adventure, risk, new things, um, but no. Um, I always want to stay settled in the routine and the place that I, that I am. And so when this came back up, back in November, this um, opportunity and um, uh, situation to possibly move to Turkey, uh, I didn't want to go, because that's my personality, and I like routine, and I love vice, and I love Indonesia. Um, and of course, I prayed for God's will, um, for him to make himself known in it. But I also prayed that we didn't have to go, um, that something would change and we didn't have to go. And of course, that didn't happen. Um, and I was left in January um, sad that I didn't get what I wanted, um, frustrated um, that God didn't understand that I thought my plans were better. Um, and so I had to face once again um, in that situation um, that I had made my plans my idol um, by me having all of those emotions. And some of those are okay. Of course, it's sad to leave and I want to stay and Bice is my family. Um, but when they were bordering on really, really upset for an extended period of time, um, I had to face um, my sin and my pride of 
the fact that um, I thought my plans were better. Um, I thought my plan for my children was better, that we should stay for them. Um, my work is important here. All of those things that we cling to. Um, and I guess I can just say, um, I'm still working through some of that process, um, but that God has been so good to me in all of it. Um, gently and lovingly and day by day, um, he's brought me to a place um, of taking my hands off the grip um, and showing me that he loves me. Um, Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. Teaching me again that I don't understand everything that he has for us in this, um, but that it's good that they're good plans, um, and that he loves us, and he loves our family, and that we can trust him and that. Um, and the strange things happens when you start to surrender your plans and your pride. Um, this peace that passes all understanding that the Bible talks about starts seeping in, and you can sit in this place and rest in this place of sadness to be leaving one thing, um, and really peace and joy about what he's bringing next. Um, and so today I get to talk to you from that place um, and tell you that those things can exist together in the midst of messy emotions. Um, and I can come to you and talk to you from a place of great thanksgiving that we serve and we love a God who wants to continue to sanctify us, wants to continue to conform us, um, is willing to put hard things in our life to grow us and is right there when we're brokenhearted about them um, to teach us and to love us and to be with us. And so I say goodbye to you guys today and I'm super sad that this is how I have to do it in front of this empty room and I probably won't get to hug you. But we can know that this is part of his plan too and he's bigger than all of our plans and goodbyes and um, things that we had int intended. Um, and I just want you guys to know um, you will always be our family and our community. You have loved us. You have served us. Um, and we will forever be grateful for this season of life. Um, and we're grateful for you. Some of the best advice I ever got was from a woman named Bev Llewellyn. I worked with her when I first started teaching, and I spent five years in college, so I was maybe 23, 24 years old, and Bev Llewellyn had already been teaching for as many years as I had been alive. She was about this tall, and she was a really amazing person. We taught some kids who were kind of rough, in public school in Eastern Oregon, you might say they were from the wrong side of the tracks. And all of those kids were scared of her. She was just a really good teacher, in a good way. Uh, so we used to sit at teacher meetings, and we used to have the school calendar out. And we'd be making plans for units and lessons. And we'd always look and say, oh, when's the next holiday? When's the next four-day weekend? When do we get a break? And Bev Llewellyn would say, well, breaks are good, but here's the thing. You can't wish your life away. You have to enjoy each day for what it is. And this advice has really stuck with me for the last 15 years, uh, because for me, it's a really good reminder. I'm the kind of person who likes to look forward to what's fun, what's coming up next that's fun. Especially when I'm getting tired, I'm working hard, and, uh, and I want to have something fun to look forward to, I remind myself, yeah, you can't wish your life away, though. Enjoy what you're doing right now. Enjoy even the hard stuff now. Um, so as I think about how to say goodbye to you all, to the students of, of Vice Secondary, here I am in this 
in this empty room uh, because we cannot meet together because of coronavirus. And uh, I thought, I think I would like to share with you some advice. Um, so let me just begin by saying uh, Mahon Maaf, and please forgive me for anything I have said or done to hurt you. Uh, I hope that you will forgive me, and I will do the same for you. Now here's my advice. You still have a lot of growing up to do. <laughs> you could take this a couple of ways. There's a very few of you who think you're hot stuff. And maybe you need to hear this because you need to know you haven't arrived yet. And actually, that's a good thing because if you think about it, if you've peaked at high school, all you have to look forward to is going downhill. But thankfully, that's not the case. But most of you, though, really need to hear this in a positive way. And that's why I wrote Growth Mindset down there at the bottom. Most of you are really hard on yourself because you're still going through the hard parts of life. You're still learning how to express yourself. You're still learning how to do the things that you want to do and not the things that you, uh, that you don't want to do. Um, you're still wondering, why can't I get a girlfriend or a boyfriend? You know, all those things will come because you still have a lot of growing up to do. Um, there's a scientific fact that your brain is not fully developed until you turn about 24 years old. Uh, so you have that uh, to look forward to for the next however many years. And even after you turn 24, even when your brain is fully developed, you can still have that growth mindset and remind yourself, I'm not perfect, that's okay, I still have room to grow. I can become a better and better human. I think especially as a teenager, it's, it's hard to realize that you're gonna grow and develop and you're gonna be a very different person when you're an adult. I think if you ask adults around you, you can come to a better understanding of that. You ask nine out of 10 adults and nine out of those 10 will say, uh, no, I wouldn't want to go back and be myself as a teenager. Uh, so uh, that's my second part of the advice to you. You have a lot of growing up to do, but also life gets better and better, especially if you have that growth mindset. Um, a lot of you have heard uh, this verse before, but this is a really good one to share with uh, secondary students, so I wanted to share that with you. Don't let anyone look down on you uh, because you are young, but set an example. Uh, even as a young person, you can set an example. And what kind of an example are you setting? You're setting an example for all the believers, young and old, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That's from Paul's letter to Timothy, one of them. Uh, I'm, gonna give you, I'm gonna give you now a couple of quotes. This one is, uh, I think actually from Walt Disney. I didn't Google it before I wrote it down, but it's, called, it's Keep Moving Forward. It was quoted by Sam Burns in my favorite TED Talk of all time. I've showed some of you that in class. If you haven't seen it, Google Sam Burns' TED Talk. He says, keep moving forward, and, and you need to remember, it doesn't mean keep moving forward into a brick wall, but it means after you've run into that brick wall, you stand up, you get up, you go a different way, but you're still going forward. And I think that that actually goes really well with this verse, um, with this quote from Jesus. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. You know, I think he was talking more about the kind of trouble that you have being persecuted for your faith, but it's true that in life we have all kinds of troubles. We have coronavirus trouble right now. People are sick, people are dying, the economy is in shambles. And all of this can be included in the troubles that Jesus said we would have. But look what he says next, take heart, I have overcome the world. We have a hope that's bigger than coronavirus, bigger than any pandemic, bigger than all the bad stuff that happens in life. We have a hope for life beyond this world. And I would encourage you uh, to take heart and remind yourself of that. Okay, finally, I'm gonna leave you uh, with a verse that was prayed over me as a teenager. And it has been really meaningful for me ever since. It says, my friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Hello, BICE community, and welcome to uh, my portion of the departing staff chapel. I'm sure as others have either mentioned in their talk or at least thought it, this is not uh, how I would have liked to do this. Because while I am here at BICE, and while I chose education to help students grow and to instill a biblical worldview, all of that is true. The fact of the matter is, I love your smiling face. I love the high fives. I love to, to joke around in the halls and just to have fun. And so I miss you guys desperately. And so for this brief uh, chapel talk, any of you who have been in my office, uh, you know that I have a poster of all of you hanging uh, on my wall. And I have this so I can see you, enjoy your faces, and so that I can pray for you. And so for this chapel talk, I am going to be talking to this poster, which will be representative of all of you. So here we go. Okay, as a departing uh, staff chapel, I have the weight of or the concern of what are my parting words to you, the secondary students at Vice. And my words in short are live in truth, remain in truth. Do not take what I say just because I am saying it. Examine everything, search for truth, live in truth, and then ground yourself in that truth and live in a manner that brings honor to those truths that you have discovered. Obviously and clearly, Bice is here because we believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that, and I have examined that, and I believe it to be true. And therefore, I choose to live my life in a manner that is glorifying to him. I wish the same for you. The disciples lived with Jesus. They knew Jesus. When Jesus left this earth after his resurrection and was ascended, they lived lives so radical in terms of sharing the story about Christ that they were all martyred, essentially, for their faith. They knew the story and the truth of Jesus to be true, and they went and gave their lives to tell that story. Many people give their lives for things. Some are deceived, some are not. Those disciples, they knew it. One of my heroes is William Wilberforce. He is a, uh, a, a common hero uh, in Christian uh, circles, and he is a noble person uh, to emulate and to celebrate. Uh, William Wilberforce, as you know, uh, was a British politician. Um, he fought for three years in the House of Commons to get a bill passed to abolish slavery. He achieved minor success with a bill. Fifteen years went by. Nothing happened actually with that bill in terms of getting rid of slavery. Um, finally, uh, after 15 years of battle and struggle, caused his health to decline in just so many different um, things. He finally passed a bill that ended the slave trade in England, and then ultimately across uh, the globe. Um, in 1825, another 12 years later, or he, re he retired um, from the House of Commons and still fighting for slaves. And then in 1833 was finally, uh, after decades of battle of his life, he freed the slaves in England, abolished the trade, and then, like we said, eventually it impacted the whole world. After that law was passed, three days later, William Wilberforce died. Now, he was a 
strong Christian, um, a believer in Christ. And so why did he commit himself to this? And what was the purpose? Well, he believed in the amazing and awesome good that is God and is the truth of Jesus and the justice that comes in that. And he believed this slave trade to be evil. And so he committed his life to it. And he was a very talented orator. Um, why didn't he pursue other things? And one of my favorite quotes, and I believe it actually is a fictitious quote, um, but in the movie Amazing Grace, which is about, um, which is about uh, the life of William Wilberforce in this battle, Charles Fox, a often political opponent of his, stood up in the middle of parliament and he said this quote. It says, when people speak of great men, they think of men like Napoleon, men of violence. Rarely do they think of peaceful men. But contrast the reception they will receive when they return home from their battles. Napoleon will arrive in pomp, in power, a man who's achieved the very summit of earthly ambition. And yet his dreams will be haunted by the oppressions of war. William Wilberforce, however, will return to his family. He will lay his head on his pillow and remember, the slave trade is no more. So I ask you the question, do we pursue things of Christ or things of earth? I suggest that while it may seem things on earth, possessions, power, may seem like great things, when you lay your head on that pillow, they'll haunt you. But when you lay your head on that pillow in the striving and the goal for justice and truth and to grant other people the knowledge of Christ, you will sleep well and will live, I suggest, a life that is full. Now, you don't have to be as prominent and as famous as William Wilberforce to do that. At one of the lowest and darkest uh, moments of uh, Wilberforce's life, he was sitting around a table and thinking about leaving politics altogether. And there were Christ-filled, wise people, people whose names we may never know, were sitting around and were giving him advice, godly wisdom. There were people like Hannah Moore, who was an author, who was begging him to stay in the fight, suggesting you don't need to do the work of Christ only in Christian ministry. She suggested it could be done in politics. There was the former slave who had a grotesque um, injury from abuse on his body. Praise God if the Lord gives you an affliction that you can use for his work, for his glory. There were radicals, there were revolutionaries, there were a bunch of people who sat around that table and gave him wisdom. Maybe you're not called to be the next William Wilberforce. Maybe you're called to be that quiet voice of godly wisdom to someone who is. I suggest participating in those things, following Christ in the pursuit of justice and truth, spreading the gospel to people who haven't heard, I'm not suggesting the battle will be easy, but I'm suggesting, and I know, that when you lay your head on that pillow, you will be celebrating the fullness of life. And so I just want to close with you um, one psalm. Psalm 1611. And Psalm 1611 reads this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Students of Vice, seek truth, find truth, live in that truth, examine that truth, and then give everything you have in order to bring glory and honor to the one truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That is my prayer for you, will always be my prayer for you. That's prayer for me in my life. And I pray that your life brings glory and is a sweet aroma to Jesus. Amen. And I want to thank all of these teachers for, for joining us today and for just pouring into your life yet another time. Uh, I know they're all so special to us and they're going to be missed. So why don't we just take a moment uh, to close out this chapel by praying a prayer of blessing over them uh, as they enter into this new season of their life. Can you join me in doing that? God, we love you and we thank you so much for these amazing people that have poured into all of our lives. They've been friends, they've been teachers, they've been confidants, and we are so grateful for them. Now, Lord, as they move into this new season, we each pray your blessing over them. God, may you protect them, may you provide for them, and may you use them greatly in this new season of their life. Continue to give them your direction and let them walk in the way that you have called them during this time. We love you and we thank you for that in your strong and mighty name. Amen. Hey guys, we love you and we pray God's blessing, safety, and health over your life. God bless you. We'll see you later.